first question, uh, ma'am, to you is starting from your journey, uh, from a film star to a political leader, and the youngest minister in the Council of Ministers. Now you're an author too. Lal Salam. You wear so many hats. Please give us some insights. First, let's start. How do you manage so much? I think that women are intrinsically and genetically inclined towards multitasking. Uh, it is quite an honor to find time for everything that you're passionate about. I believe that many of us are not blessed with ample opportunities to excel or to explore advantages that we have as latent creative potential uh, of every individual, especially women. And uh, I write in a genre which is a bit unusual. Uh, people who emanate or originate from politics either write about a particular political ideology or a particular policy. I've never conformed to the usual journeys that people undertake. Uh, Lal Salam is a book which uh, has risen from rage. Uh, I was part of a television debate 10 years ago about the killings of CRPF personnel. And in uh, the course of the conversation in that television debate, one of the panelists nonchalantly said, so what of men and women who die uh, and as they wear a uniform and serve, that is supposed to be the attribute of service. Uh, I was extremely enraged because I felt, what if one of the personnel who dies, uh, their family members has just heard this conversation? Secondly, I believe that just because they're men and women in uniform, is their life less precious? Are we to presume that it is our democratic right to send them to the front lines of violence, to, the, to send them to the front lines or at the gates of the enemy and then have them sacrificed without ensuring that justice is done, without giving them the honor that they deserve for their sacrifice? And while I was going through this enormous uh, debate in my head, uh, I felt and many uh, around me that I spoke to felt that beyond a point of time, the rage will ebb. Uh, they said, ki, dire dire, ke aaj naraz ho, ya aaj vyakul ho, because uh, people died. Maybe over a course of time, you will find peace that you have to make do with these kind of conversations. I could never make peace uh, with people who will speak against the constitution, who will raise arms against my nation state. And I found that a productive way of transitioning your rage into something which doesn't consume you, but gives you an opportunity, an outlet. Uh, the book uh, was a part of that process. Why the name Lal Salam? Um, I was very uh, vehement about the title. Mm. In fact, I picked it. I felt that uh, there will be a modicum of intrigue as to why. Uh, Lal Salam. I knew, and if you read the story, now you know why Lal Salam. It's woven in very uh, minutely into the plot. And um, I think that when I presented the book, uh, people saw the irony. I'm from a nationalist ideology. I do not subscribe to left wing politics. And uh, the Swedens are measured of creativity is such that. Uh, people were taken aback, Smriti and Lal Salam. Uh, and that, that intrigue that uh, came about because of the title of the book also helped a lot of people reach out and delve into the book. So, ma'am, it has a little bit of a, in a positive sense, as I said, that, you know, thought leadership. Uh, it's you, you, You're right that, you know, with, in, in politics, we've seen various autobiographies, biographies, et cetera, et cetera, come in, life stories come in. But some, a politician to stand for a subject this of this nature, it takes a lot of courage, a lot of conviction. Firstly, I feel that this is a genre of writing not many female authors yes, from India yes. are uh, visible in. Yeah. Secondly, yes, uh, I've always been known to be a front about what I feel on a particular subject. Um, I am conscious of the fact that I'm in a constitutional position and hence I do not write nonfiction, I don't write fiction story. Mm -hmm. And uh, for me, what was essential is the emotion that I felt. And this is though a rage which is 10 years old, it's an experience that is 20 years old. Mm -hmm. 
I've been on the field in axle affected areas for close to 20 years now. So this is two decades of ground experience. This is two decades of meeting men and women in service. In fact, particularly officers who have served in these positions, officers who have been part of investigations, officers who brought to justice such uh, violent people who have taken up arms against the Indian state. Uh, there are some officers who are still serving. They find a mention in the acknowledgments uh, in the book. And uh, for me, it was a natural course of expression. Mm. Um, the fact that um, the Red Corridor or national violence has often been romanticized mm. and the commerce behind the crime has never been witnessed, especially in literary circles where now the book circulates. Uh, that was extremely, I think, um, essential for me as an author. Mm. That if a person picks up the book because it's written by Smriti Rani, uh, shouldn't have enough meat to keep the person engrossed. Mm. And I'm happy to share with you that every reader that I've met uh, wanted to do the book start to finish. Uh, they did not want to put it down in the middle. And that was my intent as an author. That I understand maybe they'll be intrigued by the fact that Smriti Rani wrote a novel, by a novel, I'm still in office. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I wanted to ensure that you get a big bang for the buck that you spend on the book. So, ma'am, this is one, uh, and, and when I, you know, I work with thought leaders from all over the world, and, and this was a huge um, uh, surprise in one sense and a, and a comfort in another, like I said, that, you know, you've taken a very different position. What's coming next? What, what's the next topic that's close to your You know, that you are, I, uh, when I was 17, tried to be a journalist, and I failed. And uh, I stopped planning as to what's next. Though it is a horrible thing to say as an administrative leader. So if you ask me what next in terms of policies, I'll tell you. If you ask me what next as a mother, I will tell you. But if you ask me as a creative entity, what next? I think the creative process is such, the churn is such, that you are looking to say a story or a character. And you are lucky if you find a medium. I have been a part of the media industry now for two and a half decades. Uh, which is a long, long time. And I have evolved from being an actor to a producer to a writer. And I've done various mediums of expression. I've done television. I have done newspaper columns. Um, I've been a part of Indian theater, movies, uh, and now a novel. Uh, what next is surely that there are many an ideas that I would like to express. What is the medium? Time will tell. Ma'am, just a, uh, this is not a question. This is a, a, a thought that I, an emotion that I want to share that I have in my uh, decades of career. And when I saw you for the first time from a distant, distance, I've not seen a person with a greater impact uh, in presence and in words than you. And uh, I, I, I request you, I urge you to ma'am use that and, and, and bring more such thought leadership out. Tell us your story. Tell us what we can learn uh, from you. If I can take uh, you away from the book for a moment, I want to understand from you maybe in, in, in a few minutes or, or however you want to spend, what's been your journey like and share with us three lessons as you stand right now, maybe a shot of your book to come. Okay, so I am speaking to you from a house which is 10 kilometers away from where I was born. And when I was born, my parents barely had 150 bucks. They had a room over a cow shed, a tabela. Uh, they married out of love, uh, must, much against the wishes of their families, and hence were left to fend for themselves. My father, and if you're from Delhi, you would know that there is a place called the Army Club in front of Dalakwa, would put a chadar, a bed sheet on the floor, and sell books. As I would watch the traffic go by, my mother was an English teacher. Uh, who graduated to a good job at Taj Mahal Singh as a housekeeper. Hmm. And uh, when I went to Bombay, uh, on the last day, just before I got a job, I just had the last 200 rupees. So I used to walk the distance to look for a job. Now, in fact, I was a feminine Miss India finalist in 98, and I had to borrow money to compete. And then I had to take on a job to just pay back the money that I competed with. And uh, it is fascinating that when I was all of 10 years old, 
I remember I started telling people, one day I'll be somebody. So I belong to a very conservative family. My father is a North Indian. And my mother is a Bengali who's traveled the entire country courtesy her, her father who served in the Navy. And the one thing that I heard everybody say, uh, especially because when you come from a challenged uh, economic family, uh, people always say that you don't expect a great outcome. You basically expect to be married off to a family which is possibly financially a bit better off, but not more than that. Uh, the maximum that you can achieve is a good teacher's job or some uh, regular income. Uh, or maybe if you're entrepreneurial enough, you can do masala, papad, and possibly sell a few things across uh, the community you live in. And here was this 10-year-old kid saying, listen, watch out for me. So I think the first thing in life is audacity defines you. And I had absolutely no hope in hell. I, it's not as if I had the IQ of Einstein. It's not as though I had great economic means to achieve something. But I think what sailed me through is audacity, belief in the fact that I will get where I want to get. And um, the second aspect is the ability to take the chance. And I think that that ability emanates from belief. I left my house when I was 17 years old to pursue a career in a city that I had absolutely not a single person that I knew into a field like media where I had absolutely no contacts, no connections, not a single vertical of the media business that I had experience in or I had discovered talent for. So the fact that I could take a chance, um, that fact emanated from the audacity that I just spoke of. And I think the third uh, flag that you'd like me to bear or for that matter that flutters in my life is the acceptance that life will transform itself. And when you accept transformation as a part of your life's journey, you do not stagnate. I do not want to rest on the laurels that I brought to myself and my family through media or through politics. As a politician, I have fought one of the most difficult elections in our country. And I won. In 2014, when I said, watch out, I will win, people felt, how dare she say this? So I think if you dare to dream and dare to live, you manage to create history. I celebrated when you won. You don't celebrate. I celebrated when you won. Because everything is momentary. Mm. And what you achieve is not fair on consumption. Rudyard Kipling had a beautiful poem called If. So if you read it, mm. I don't get swayed by success or by failures. I don't think that that defines me. What possibly defines me is effort. What possibly defines me is the desire to push myself. What possibly eggs me on is the fact that I have access to opportunity and I have access to opportunity because I'm open to transformation. I do not believe the age of 45, after having been a minister in four different portfolios, there's much that I can still learn. As somebody in the media business who was at the top of my game, when I transitioned and switched off that career, I did not believe that that was the pinnacle. There was much more I could have done. As a parent today, the only thing that I can give my kids is those three things. The difference is my kids come from comfort. I did not. So if you want me to add a fourth peg to this conversation, is that success comes from struggle. It never comes from comfort. If you're comfortable, you'll never push yourself. Tell me one thing, ma'am. I mean, when I look at and I, when I look at a journey like yours, you know, or or any leader who's who's changed things, it's not easy, right? I mean, you get battered, and today in the age of social media, and all, you get battered by people who have, I mean, all kinds of people in all formats. 
or and, and other things also i mean the challenges other challenges of your job and and your your life personally health children parents and all how how do you keep pushing yourself who do you do it for if you do it for others then you tend to give up fast if you do it for yourself you tend to stick your neck I remember when I was leaving home I told my father and he's a very conservative father in my 25 years of marriage my father has never come home and had even a cup of tea or a glass of water <laughs> that is how conservative he is he says beti ke ghar ka hum pani bhi nahi pite and the first girl in my family to work they were normally were married off when they were 18 because that was the age of marriage and uh, i told my father when i was leaving home that if you believe in the value systems you've given me you need to let me go because i've lived 17 years of my life as your daughter and it is presumed that i'll live the rest of my life at the command of my husband and if i have a son then at this direction and i said when do i live for myself so i think that you push yourself when you take complete responsibility for your life I've always maintained that I'm happy to pay the price for my own decisions and not happy to bear the brunt for somebody else's misgivings. Tell me something about your uh, uh the, the the health side of things. How do you keep and and mental health and physical health? How do you keep your sanity amidst all that chaos? And you talked about being perplexed. I'm sure you're perplexed every single second. I am somebody who did not look after my physical health because I was working um, at least 18 hours a day. Yeah. Even today I have I remember my last holiday per se was in 2012 the decade now. Um these are the choices you make as professionals. There is nothing called miss or mister habit So you need to decide which segment of your life is to be cut off, sacrificed, or for that matter, put on the back burner. I was a trained athlete in school, who won medals for her academic institution. But when I progressed on to a professional life, I just didn't have the time to train. Similarly, um, when you talk about health per se. I think a lot of professionals today try to balance uh the health needs that they have for themselves and that of their family members. But you ask those who are overachievers. There's always some segment of their life that they've let go. For me it was I have zero social life. It's just work and family. The only difference is I found family even at work. um the other aspect that i think on mental health you need to be extremely self assured enough to know when do you need help when do you need to take a step back when do you need a moment to breathe but what helps keep you dynamic in your engagement is if you have a variety in what you do So for me um I do a lot of policy work I do a lot of administrative work but I would know a segment of society that I possibly am not very well informed on For instance I did a completed a course with Berkeley on fintech Now many people said that I have done finance programming in the education sector for the textile sector and, and people were taken aback why would you want to do this And I said well this is an area that I'd like to evolve my skills in. So I think that when you are committing yourself to something new as a skill set it also helps give you that mental space to evolve on issues other than what is demanded of or needed of. So from that point of view I think that and I've always known when to take a breath. When to step back. and just look at my whole life in perspective and then move ahead so when you have that capacity to consume 
your own life's failings, advantages, you are positioned to take better decisions for yourself as an individual. The only problem is we don't teach that to our girls. We teach our girls to be so sacrificing that we tell them do it at the cost of your own health, your own time and your own mental peace. And that is why we get a lot of questions about women who have to balance the work-life balance. You never get these questions asked to men. We tell women that if you are not struggling, that means you're not trying enough to balance. We judge women professionally also from the perspective of how good a wife, mother, daughter they are. Men at work never get judged as husbands, fathers and brothers. Or for that matter, son. That brings me to you know, for us at speaking particularly, you know, we are in fact, the reason why I'm here is because we're doing a mega conversation on diversity and inclusion where thought leaders from all over Singapore are getting together. With International Women's Day also coming up, uh, how do you see the shape of uh, Indian women changing uh, in the coming years? I think that there are two, three aspects which have unleashed how women are viewed potentially from our country. Mm. There's a presumption that issues such as access to credit, mm. issues such as building up of enterprise, mm. are issues which are very urban in nature. Mm. And now with schemes like Mudra, mm. and you see 70% beneficiaries are women, mm. we see more and more women putting together a business plan for smaller enterprises, going to a bank, assuring them of returns and doing wonderfully well. Mm. If you look at microfinance companies and financial institutions, you will find that we have 99% returns on investment for every female development. Now, today, when I talk about financial institutions, women's capacity to be enterprising, women's skill sets, we also need to recognize that there are certain issues on which I would hope to see more support for women. And one of them is the technology sector. Okay. As technology expands, mm -hmm. we see more and more female consumption of technology. But we need to be cognizant that those who are in ownership position are comparatively less. In technological institutions, those who are in a position to be the supreme decision makers, women in such institutions are comparatively less. And women who innovate mm. will not find as much VC support as possibly a male innovator. So we still need a lot of support so that we evolve an ecosystem wherein uh, innovation by a woman is thought of and it transitions successfully into enterprise. The other aspect is that there are women such as yourself who have started in enterprise, who get that proverbial pat on the back, well done, as though this is good enough. We need to encourage such institutions to become mid-sized companies. So there was a mindset, oh, look how lovely she's opened a small organization. I'm done with that. I need that organization to become a mid-sized company. And if it's a mid-sized company in the digital space, I need it to become a unicorn. And I need more and more such examples. So I think that from a female perspective, now we have Indian women who say, our time has come. And I'm glad that my boss, who's the Prime Minister of India, says, now is the time for women-led development. Both who here, Mahila ka development. Now make sure that you centralize her role in leading development of your country. Now in the current capacity, ma'am, I mean, you, you, you've taken over uh, uh, the, as Minister for Women and Child Development. What is your vision? What are some of the near term? You used to be very comfortable with the policy, but, but tell us something that is uh, coming up. Any Any new... Uh, changes, any new announcements? 
Oh, lots of them. In fact, we just in the last session of Parliament introduced the Prohibition of Child Marriage Act of Men, which uh, now increases the age of marriage for women and brings it up to 21 years of age. What is interesting is that in 75 years of our independence, men and women could not enter matrimony at the same age. Men were at 21, women were at 18. And it's delightful how women across all communities have come together in support of this. And the few naysayers are men who are hooting and shouting and screaming in Parliament. And when I ask them, why are they so defensive? They said, nahi, aurat aur mard ke beech mein thoda to fasla hona chahiye. So I think that in terms of reform, this in the 75 years of our independence in the Azadi Kamrit Motsav is one of the most tenacious but much needed step towards the right to equality. The fact that women across all communities, all religions, all uh, castes and creeds and regions will have the right to enter into matrimony at 21 is a great effort that has been initiated by the Union Cabinet under the leadership of the Honorable Prime Minister. We now are digitally tracking and serving close to 9 crore female and children beneficiaries across the country on nutrition programs. We are coming up with an amendment to the Juvenile Justice Act where the entire adoption, foster care, sponsorship processes and childcare establishments in our country will see a complete freehold. We are also starting new initiatives to make sure that we have more and more working women hostels, creches for working women, along with the fact that now we are also giving emphasis to female-related re research activities. So there are many gender-based potential issues on which there is a lack of research. So this year is also a year where I'm pushing the envelope when it comes to female and child-related research issues. Fantastic. So, ma'am, my I'm, I'm on the last leg of my conversation, and uh, I I would come want to come back and understand again uh, the Smriti Rani that we see, the Smriti Rani that I, I am in awe of. Uh, how do you deal? with the politics of politics. For example, you know, you talked about the age, right? I mean, the look, the mind is not going to be common sense that you oppose karte just for the heck of it. I mean, just because you are in politics. I mean, how do you deal with that? I mean, it's not coming to understand. It's common sense. Hai. But, uh, you, how question. you question, you learn, you introspect. How do you get... I think you? as a woman, as you age, as you gain more and more experience, you stand at the sidelines and then watch a lot of people have the inability to express the reasons behind their rage. I am very grateful that I am today in a position where I can engage in a dialogue and deliberation with many a people in our country, especially those who are well-meaning, those who want to contribute mm -hmm. towards resolutions towards solutions. But those who say no just for the sake of saying no, mm -hmm. those who say no just because they are against reform, there's ample space through dialogue for them to meet in terms of vision for the country, eye to eye with me or with policymakers. And even if they don't, I think that our biggest celebration as a democracy is the fact that we can all respectfully Agree to disagree. I was talking about somebody here today, and this I mean, we were talking about India and and, the, and and Singapore for India, Singapore developed and the rest of this, this thing. I was like the amount of the amount of ability, the freedom that we have to speak in India, it doesn't exist anywhere in the world. True. So, I think we need to recognize that for seventy five years in our country, we've spoken about our rights. Now is the time to even recognize our responsibilities. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. My last question, ma'am, to you is, and then, of course, I mean, you've, you've let me, anything else that you would like to share? What makes you happy? A nice cup of tea <laughs> and a good conversation. <laughs> oh, 
you're fantastic i look forward to having one with you in person aapke sath baith ke chai and and in conversation but anything else that you would like to add to this conversation it's an absolute pleasure to have this chat and i look forward to meeting you in delhi thank you so much ma'am and i would also like to uh, to share with you that uh, nearly 500 copies of lal salam uh, have been absorbed by our experts all over the country and uh, reviews of uh, are pouring in feedback is pouring in we'll keep sharing that back with you and devansh i hope it's all good and i hope people have enjoyed what they've read i have thoroughly enjoyed and thank you so much ma'am such an honor thank you thank you thank you so much